Oh, there it is. Hi, everyone who's joining. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes for people to get logged in. Mary Claire, I don't know if you can can hear us now. Is that any better, Mary Claire? No, I don't think so. Nope. Stuart, you're on the panel. <laughs> Unexpectedly. Sorry, I don't know how I managed to get onto the panel. Fine. Apologies. I, I thought I was logging in anonymously. Sorry, everybody. I'll mute myself. It's okay. No rowdy behaviour now. Fletcher was just logging in on another um, laptop. The mic wasn't working on the one that, that yeah. they were on. No problem. That's great. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thanks, everyone, for being here. It seems to have slowed down. So look, I'll start with some introductions and if people are joining over the next couple of minutes, that's fine. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining us on our webinar this evening. Um, we're delighted to add to our, our series of webinars and um, I suppose this is um, a good move on from what we've done already. So we had a look last year in another webinar at DARE, which is the Disability Access Route to Education. Um, so for moving from second to third level, um, we looked also at moving from primary to second level um, for young people who uh, either child cancer survivors or young people who are going through treatment. And now we are here tonight and we're going to look at uh, non-traditional or alternative routes. So if you're a parent or a young person or a teacher, um, trying to support somebody to make the make these decisions and find the right fit for them. Um, I hope that you'll leave this evening with lots of hope and ideas about what's out there. Um, and we will also speak to Melissa's daughter Fletcher when they're able to log in um, about their own experiences of youth reach and further education. So I'll just introduce our panel. Um, I'm Fanula Murphy, working with Childhood Cancer Ireland. Um, one of our directors, Mary Claire Rennick, is on, but having difficulties. I don't know if she can hear me. She's certainly having difficulties with her mic. Um, Mary Claire may be able to, to join properly later and answer any questions that you might have for the charity specifically. Mary Claire is a parent of a survivor. Um, We've just lost Rory. We're having some technical, everyone seems to be having some technical difficulties tonight. So if anyone, if you need to turn off your camera, um, please do, uh, if that saves on your on your Wi-Fi or whatever. So our first panelist I'll introduce is Melissa Bracken. Melissa is uh, kind of here with two hats tonight um, as a parent of a survivor. Fletcher, um, as I said, is Melissa's daughter, but she is also she also works in the Ad adult education service in the city of Dublin. Um, education and Training Board as a community education facilitator. So I'm delighted that Melissa was able to join us because she has a wealth of knowledge about the different routes that are open to young people. Um, and uh, she's going to talk us through some of those briefly this evening. Um, our other panellist who is just coming back now is Dr. Rory O'Sullivan. Um, and Rory is the principal of Calester and Marino College of Further Education. So Rory's going to tell us a little bit about um, the, the further, further education option, if you feel that's um, an option for you. And it, I suppose the timing of this webinar is good because there's lots of open days happening um, either, you know, now or in the, early in the new year. Um, of course, we know about the CAO forum um, and all that that entails. Um, I suppose part of why we wanted to host this webinar was if you've, if anybody's feeling that, you um, all is lost if the Leaving Cert doesn't go according to plan or indeed if the Leaving Cert is not the right option to you, that there are in fact lots of options out there. So that's why we're here. And also my colleague Rebecca Lawler will manage the chat. So if you have any questions, um, 
please do put them into the chat and we will come to them at the end of each presentation and then at the end altogether as well, if that's okay. Um, you can so you can use the chat or raise hand function um, and we'll we'll come to those questions. Mary Claire, I just want to check in with you to see if you've got yes. sound. Oh, great. Yes, I am. <laughs> Sorry about that. Some uh, just a glitch, uh, but uh, just I'm Mary Claire Rennick. I'm a parent of a, ch a 20 year old child of cancer survivor. She was uh, had leukemia when she was 10. And I just think this is a, a, a great uh, webinar to be having tonight, particularly at this stage of um, let's say leaving search and ex an exam pre um, preparation for, for, for many people and to, um, to, to be discussing uh, all the options that are out there. And I know that they're vast. I'm delighted to see um, Melissa and Rory here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Claire. And actually, just before we start, I did want to mention, I mentioned that we held a webinar on DARE roughly around this time last year. So that's Disability Access Route to Education. Um, we're not going to go into that in huge detail this evening. You can look back on that webinar. It's linked on our website. It's on our YouTube channel. There's lots of information on the DARE website. Please do have a look at that if you feel it's a route that you want to take because there's some key deadlines and dates that you need to be aware of. And just for anyone who may have heard of it before, there's been a change to the admission criteria of late. So a positive development for childhood cancer survivors in that there's now um, it's now open to children and young people who are in remission. So there's no longer a criteria that your your diagnosis, your treatment had to be in the last three years. So if you were diagnosed at age three and you're now 18 and applying through DARE, um, it's much simpler process. So as I said, there is there is a wealth of information there. We ha held a really good and interesting webinar on it last year, so I'm not going to go over any of that tonight, but just to direct you to those resources if you need them. So, Melissa, I'm going to do your slides um, just to save your, your Wi-Fi. So just give me a moment and I'll get that set up. Thanks, Vanilla. So is that OK? Can everybody see that? Um, yeah, yeah, I can see it. There we go. OK, great. Thanks, so, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, delighted to be able to get a chance, I suppose, to talk about this because um, sometimes I think with all the, the noise about the CAO and kind of roots into university that sometimes these alternative pathways get a little bit pushed to one side or forgotten about or not talked about as much. And as Fanula mentioned, I have two hats on me here tonight. Um, first of all, um, Fletcher, who will be talking later, is my youngest and um, was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer when they were three years old um, and obviously had a lot of treatment relating to that. Um, thankfully, came out very well from, you know, the cancer was was um, treated successfully, but was left with long term damage to her heart. Um, and eventually had to, following kind of a number of years of treatment and, and different options, different kind of, um, yeah, I suppose different treatments um, was listed for a heart transplant at the age of uh, 15 and took um, got a heart transplant um, in 2017, so five years ago. Um, so we've had, I suppose, uh, you know, Fletcher has had a long and difficult path through the formal education system and has missed huge chunks um, of of her of their education and you know unfortunately was too ill to do their junior cert and um, and again was too ill to do their leaving cert um, so one of the things I suppose that saved us as a family in terms of stress and worrying about that kind of you know anxiety around what were the long term implications of that. Um, was that I was already working in the adult education service and um, and in the community education service. So I was very well aware of all the different options that would be available, even if they didn't succeed um, kind of through the, the more traditional route of leaving cert points and into third level education. Um, if you just want to go on to the next slide there, Vanilla. So tonight, I suppose, is just going to talk briefly about all the different options that are available. Um, and 
can you can you just move on? yeah that's perfect all the different options that are available and I said I'd start with this because it gives I suppose a span of the qualification framework that we have in Ireland um, and I'm not sure how familiar people are with it but it's a good thing to get get familiar with so that you can kind of see where accreditation and certification comes in and um, so you'll see there kind of on the second rim there's kind of the junior certificate and the leaving certificate and if you track them down you'll see that they come in between level three and level five um, and what we'd normally say is kind of honours junior cert or pass leaving cert is in around the four um, and then that the, the three and five are the other side of it um, and then in terms of after school you can go into institutes of technology or further education colleges and you, they do they span from level five to level six and then the universities span from level seven for a pass degree level eight for an honors degree level nine for a master's and then level 10 for a doctorate um, and then you see your one certificate um so in the further education and training sector which is what we'll both myself and Rory will be talking about tonight. Um, we offer accreditation really at level, um, I'm not sure how many people offer at level one, but certainly between level two and level um, six on that scale. Um, and then there are progression routes from that into level seven or level eight um, degree courses in higher education. Um, so if you just go on to the next slide, the first thing I want to talk about tonight, I suppose, is an option to um, at the school age. Sorry, Melissa, um, every time I, I hit next, there's a, a delay for some reason. A little bit of a delay. That's no problem. There. Sorry about that. Yeah. OK, so um, youth reach, I suppose, is an option. They They take people from 16 to 20 years, although I have heard I suppose unofficially of people at age 15 entering into youth reach as well. Um, but they they kind of bring learners through an alternative pathway to the leaving cert. Um, they it's full time, usually over two years, you can see there. And um, the centres are managed by what we call education and training boards, so ETBs. And there's um, 16 ETBs throughout the country. So there's one you need to find out what your local education and training board is. They sometimes run schools as well, primary schools or secondary schools, but they run the further education and training provision in the area for the most part. Um, learners that go on to youth reach can work towards a junior cert or a leaving cert, and that can be applied as well. Um, but they also tend to work at major awards at the QQI. So if you remember the framework at that level, um, at level two, three or four. Um, and just, I suppose, to say a little bit about those modules, a major award contains eight modules um, or eight subjects. And each subject is um, what they do is they put together a portfolio, either of assignments, assessments or um sometimes exams depending on the subject and Fletcher might talk a little bit about this but it's it's quite um accessible for people I suppose because you build on each piece of it it's kind of one of those things that you put together bit by bit and um can be tailored to the pace that you're working at so the youth reach um if you can just go on to the next slide sorry Fanula. So just put in on that slide just a sample program that's available in a youth reach in Balbriggan, which is part of the Dublin Dunleary ETB. And, then, and you can see that they've really tailored it to the learners that, they, that have come in. So they can offer subjects at level two, level three, level four and level five, and also a range of non-certified subjects. Um, they're all Every program is different. Some kind of will, um, some programs will kind of specialize I suppose in catering or maybe some woodwork or some uh, IT subjects and um, so really the best thing to do is talk to your youth reach coordinator which would be in your local ETB if you want to find out more about the youth reach program that's available near you and um, if you go on to the next slide and back one sorry sorry about that got carried away there you go 
Um, so some of the extra things that are available in Youth Breach, and I know which Fletcher found really useful, um, they have one-to-one -one counselling career guidance that, that the young people can avail of when they're in there. Um, there is a training allowance if you're aged over 16, it's 45 euro per week, um, or it's 208 euro per week for over 18s. Um, or you can retain your um, disability benefit if that's something that you're on and, and that's the payment that you can claim when you're when you're um, attending. And there's various progression time back to education initiative. There's um, apprenticeships and they're usually run in conjunction with further education colleges or other um, further education courses. Um, it's coming up that my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah. Maybe turn off your camera, Melissa, that might help. Yeah, actually, that's what I'll do. That's a good idea. Um, It'll take some of the pressure off. Great. Okay. And I suppose within Youth Reach, there's a few features that, that I suppose make it different to schools. The class sizes are very small. Um, the, the teacher or tutor ratio to students is, is much lower, so that quite often I know in Fletcher's case there might have been only six or seven students in the class um, and they tend to cater for people who are just have difficulties coping with the demands of um, secondary schools so maybe the, you know whether it's physical demands of it maybe there's some kind of um, you know stress or anxiety around attending school um, just people I suppose who are not coping well within that formal education structure and they're very supportive um, they're, you know, they're they're well used to dealing with um, students that may have a lot of additional needs or support needs. Um, and then once I suppose you you transition out of youth reach or even out of school, there's another program that's available through the ETBs. And if you want to go on to the next one, Fanula. Which is called the Back to Education Initiative. Um, and this is, it's a part-time programme. It is open to anybody over the age of 16, um, but there's no upper age limit. So you might be in with um, people who might be a lot older, like in, in their 20s or 30s or even 40s. Um, but they have people who have left full-time education. It's very flexible. They have morning, afternoon and evening options. Um, all courses are free and students can receive a social welfare payment or a part-time training allowance. And accreditation again can be offered at level two, three, four, or five, depending um, on, on what level that you, you should be working at at that particular time. Um, so here I just kind of put in two sample um, BTI programs that are being offered by, I'm trying to think, I think it's Wexford, yeah, Wexford Town Centre. Um, both of these happen to be at level five, but as I said, they can be at different levels. Um, so you could work towards a qualification in youth work there that was a two year program, or you could work towards something like digital marketing skills to compete. So very varied again from education from ETB to ETB there's kind of a very wide range um, of programs available, but it's a very good option if you feel that physically you're not able for a full time program where you have to come in five days a week and maybe spend six or seven days um attending classes or studying um, and that is open and again very supportive small class sizes lots of support around literacy needs whether they're you know um writing skills or study skills or it skills that would all be put in place um okay can you go on to the next sorry if you can hear any background noise that's my dog trying to jump up in my lap um interrupting me OK, so then just briefly to talk about apprenticeships um, and training centres. Again, this is another option available to people. Um, and again, Rory, I know, is going to talk a little bit more about the apprenticeships. And um, they've really come on in leaps and bounds over the last few years. And there's a lot of, um, I suppose, a lot of innovation and creativity around them. And um, they can be between two and four years duration. And um, there's actually about 64 options now available to people. Um, and it's kind of a mix of, they call them earn and learn. So you're employed, um, you're in employment, you're paid. Um, there's kind of 50% of them are, are on the job. And then the other, the other time is spent kind of, I suppose, learning in the classroom. Um, 
they've always been traditionally a male kind of uh, progression route, but there's been, as you can see there, a 114% increase in women apprentices. And that kind of reflects, if you go on to the next slide, Hanula, it reflects, I suppose, the much broader range of apprenticeships that are now available. Um, I suppose typically think about, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, crafts of plumbing and electricity but as you can see there from the slide and um, there's there's a very wide range and they're being added to all the time um, and I think yeah Rory's going to talk about how to apply for an apprenticeship later on um, and then just on to the next slide Um, so this is the adult education service, and I suppose this might be of interest, um, not just to young people who who kind of have survived cancer and are thinking about different options available to them, um, but also to parents or families or carers or anybody else, because um, this is a service that I'm involved in, um, and this is kind of where I've been working for the past number of years. Um, it's available to anybody over the age of 18. Um, the courses are free and um, they're part time. They're usually two hours a week or sometimes um, they can be twice a week again for about two hours or one and a half hours per week. Um, the, we have three separate programs here. Literacy, which kind of focuses on developing people's skills in reading, writing, numeracy and IT. Um, we have a very large English as a second or other language program, particularly with, um, I suppose, all the, the, the refugees we've been having from Ukraine recently. And then the community education program is more about, I suppose, the creative arts or leisure courses, which are really good for kind of well-being, but also in terms of kind of getting people back into the classroom. So we often talk about the community education being a stepping stone into further education. So, you know, if it's something that you kind of, you know, it's, it's a nice positive experience you can have around education before you go into the next step. Um, and we offer like, Again, they vary from education and training boards, but there's a very wide range available. Um, and they can be, all our courses are offered at, are unaccredited, or they can offer accreditation at level one to four on that framework that I showed you on the second slide. Um, if you want to go on to the next one. And then just, I suppose, finally, we do, have an adult education guidance service um, and it's a free confidential um, service it's really really good and um, they're not so basically they're, they although they're located within the ETBs they're not tied to giving guidance just around uh, courses available from ETBs and um, so they look at everything um, including like the National Learning Network they might look at courses and um, private colleges anything that's available um, they are available, they usually deal with people over 18, but also anybody over the age of 16 who has left formal education and is looking for, um, you know, kind of, I suppose, a different route. Um, they give impartial advice, as I mentioned, and I, like I can't recommend them highly enough. They're, re they're lovely people, you know, in terms of the, their training and their, their friendly and professional approach, but can kind of give you this, the, the tailored um, advice that you will need. Um, and they, you can go in and talk about your interests and what you would like to do long term and if there's a career that you have in mind and they will be able to map out a progression path for you through the further education and training sector or through the higher education. So that's um, a highly recommended service. And then on to the next slide. Um, I just put together some useful websites that I thought um, I thought that it might, uh, you, you know, that would be useful given the different options that are available and sometimes how hard it is to find information. Um, Qualifax, One Stop Shop, I don't know, people are probably familiar from that with, through school. Um, but fetchcourses.ie is um, the database of all full-time and part-time further education courses. Um, and then there's apprenticeship.ie. There's the National Learning Network. I don't know a huge amount about them, going to admit it, but um, they, I do know they offer courses to people who kind of have brain injuries and, and they also offer for supports to third level education. And then there, if you want to kind of locate your local adult education guidance service, that's on the ETBI 
website, which is the Education Training Board Ireland website. So um, I know that was a, a lot of information and kind of a whistle stop tour of it. Um, but I hope that you found it useful. I think and we're going to hand over to Rory now and maybe keep questions for the end. Is that right, Fanula? Is that the way you want to do it? Sorry, I was muted. How, how are we doing there, Rebecca, on, on questions or chat? We might keep them, keep them until um, the end. It'll probably been, make more sense. Yeah, there's been nothing yet. OK, um, I think I saw a raised hand. I can't see it now, but I'll come. We'll, we'll come back to you if you if you had your hand raised. Uh, thanks, Melissa. That was really interesting. Thanks for all those resources that you put together at the end. And just to say to everybody that I will circulate all that information um, so that you can refer back to it in your own time. Um, and, and thank you. I think that's really helpful because, as you said, it, it can be difficult to know where to start looking. Um, and you know time consuming I suppose so you've laid out a path there for people I, that I think will be really helpful thank you for that um so I'll pass over to Rory who as I said earlier is principal of Cholester Marino College of Further Education um and he's going to tell us a little bit about what they do thanks Rory okay thanks Fanula um are you going to share hosting oh sorry with me? yes I will one second now Um, I think that's me now. My co-host there. Is that you? Yep, I think yep. so. Okay, thanks. So just we'll have a go at this. Yeah, we have that. No. Right, can everybody see that? We can, thanks. Okay. Uh good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rory O'Sullivan, as uh, Fanola has said. I'm the principal of Calestra Marino College of Further Education. And like Melissa, Melissa I also work for the City of Dublin ETB, um, but in the, in the college's uh, dimension. So I'm just going to uh, talk about, try to maybe explain some, some of the terms that we use in Further Ed that uh, some people find um, baffling. Um, this is what I call the the, the the FET triangle, the Further Education and Training Triangle. We have SOLAS, who are the Further Education and Training Authority. And they provide the policy direction and the funding. You have QQI are the National Agency for Quality Assurance and Certification in Further Education. And then you have the 16 ETBs, as Melissa had mentioned in our presentation. There are effectively three types of, of FET courses. There are, so it depends on the purpose that you want to, uh, why do you want to do a course? What's the end game, as it were? So if you want to use the PLC, for example, uh, for a further study, there are the PLC courses with links to third level colleges. With courses for people who want to come into employment, a PLC course can be used for that. There are traineeships and they're with links to employers and we've had apprenticeships. And according to the uh, apprenticeship.ie website, there are 83 apprenticeships approved for Ireland um, since June of 2022. Um, just in the apprenticeship space, there are what, what you might refer to as the traditional apprenticeships. When people think of apprenticeships, they can often think of, you know, carpenter, plumber, um, the buildings area and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's fair enough, but it isn't always, uh, there isn't um, there's an awful lot more than that. In 2016, there was a particular reform of apprenticeships that came in. So you have a quite a wide range and the full list is available on apprenticeship.ie. Um, <clears throat> there is one body for certifying further and higher education, that's QQI. Um, <clears throat> Melissa has described this um, national framework qualifications in detail, so I won't, I won't delay. We can always deal with that in, in the, the, the chat and the Q&A afterwards if anyone has specific questions. But my college deals in the level five and level six. So that would be um, the second block of the uh, the green, the first and <clears throat> second last on the last block of the green and the first block of the pink. Uh, that would be the area that we work in. So what are these uh, course? They're QQI certified. So they're one year duration. So that's Q at QQI level five. And QQI level five would be the equivalent of higher leave insert. 
Uh, and the second year, which would be equivalent to year one of a third level, which would be a QQI level six. They're continuous assessment. So that basically means you could end up with courses that are uh, project work during the year um, with a combination of an end of year exam. Just to give you a sense of it, in, in my own college, about two thirds of the subjects that we deliver uh, do not have an end of year exam. So that just gives you an idea. A lot of the a lot of the assessments are done during the year. Work placements are a part of all courses and they can lead, to, as I said earlier, to further study, employment or for uh, onto apprenticeships. So how do you get into one? Well, first of all, there are no points for further education or PLC courses. You apply directly to the college or since last year through the CAO. There are often, there's often an interview involved that can be particularly in the area of social, uh, of social care. The course costs, roughly speaking, and it will vary from college to college and there may be some exceptions, is three to 400 a year. And SUSE grants are available for PLC courses. This is what the CAO website looks like in terms of when you go in, you're offered the left-hand button. Um, it is the higher education and that'll be the traditional CAO website that people have known for years. Further education and training button in the middle, that will lead to um, a full database of all the further education and training courses in Ireland. And um, then you have the apprenticeship button and that leads to information on apprenticeships. The key difference with apprenticeships is because they are a contract of employment, a prerequisite for an apprenticeship is to have an employer. But a lot of the colleges now work closely with employers so you can actually be recruited directly. You can actually join an apprenticeship by approaching a college directly. So from a PLC or a FET course to third level, how do you do this? So you've completed your, your level five, for example, you apply to on the CAO form in the usual way. Same deadline, 1st of February, same as everything else. You tick one more box. About 30% of PLC students roughly every year apply through the CAO. And of all the, core, all the higher education courses that are available on the CAO, about 88% of them have a, have a, a link uh, from a further ed or QQI qualification. For some, P for some students, PLC courses can improve their chances of completing a degree by 17%, and that's national data uh, published by Sullis and actually um, provided by the Central Statistics Office. The most important thing here, if you are interested in using the PLC course for progression purposes, you need to check with the Higher Education College to make sure that the course that you're in, the further education course you're interested in is linked to the higher education course you're aiming at. There are the list of uh, the websites that um, are helpful, I would think. I think um, Melissa mentioned one or two of these. There's cao.ie, qualifax.ie is a course database. Careers Portal is a particularly useful uh, database for uh, progression from further ed to higher ed. And then there's fetchcourses.ie is the national website for all further education courses across the country. My own college, uh, Start Office Kilester College, uh, many years ago, and as of September 21, we have uh, consolidated with Marino College, so we've doubled in size. And um, in October of this year, we actually have opened our third campus in Cahill Brewer Street, the old college catering building, which I'll come to in a second. There are still two websites as we're in a period of transition. Um, and you will see a list of 33 full-time courses, but it's all on one application system and it's an online system. So you go into whichever website you choose, um, press on apply for the course and it'll bring you through to the online application system. This will just give you an idea of what the college looks like. These are the three campuses now. Calester College, top right-hand corner. Marino Campus is the bottom right and our new Cahill Brewer Campus is uh, to the left. This gives you some idea when we were converting um, Cahill Brewer to a further ed from an old, from a traditional higher ed environment to a, to a, a new further ed environment, we had to move from the traditional, which was tiered seating you can see on the top left. And UDE stands for Universal Design in Education. 
So we have to, uh, it's part of further education that we use universal design for education, universal design for learning, for teaching and learning, so we can incorporate and include as many people as possible to the greatest extent possible in as, as much of what we can do as possible. So in, in doing that, being flexible, you can, in a tiered seating environment, you can see there it is um, a very inflexible environment. So the top right hand corner photograph, and that is what that exact room looks like today. And you'll see there's freestanding tables and they're put in groups. So we actually, you, as well as teaching teamwork as a subject, we actually use, te we use teamwork to teach. So students are put into teams and they can work in groups on various different projects or issues that they might be dealing with um, as you go along. Now, our new campus is also uh, a completely digital campus, a digital college. There are no chalkboards or whiteboards. Everything is electronic. So um, we're entirely based on cloud technology and web-based learning. So if for any reason, due to illness or for whatever any, any reason, that somebody can't participate, they can't actually attend, they can continue to participate because we have the capacity through the um, web-based system to maintain participation without necessarily maintaining attendance. Obviously attendance in person is preferable, but we have that facility now. You can see on the bottom right-hand corner, that's what the actual full kit looks like. There's the interactive touchscreen um, and all classrooms look identical. The um, on the top right hand photograph, you will see a screen at the back and there is a motion detecting camera on that screen. So we can actually live stream, conduct hybrid classes, blended learning, online learning or in-person learning all at the same time. Um, that was what the bill, that's what we designed into the building. And you'll see bottom left hand corner, that's one of our teachers in full operation. Uh, the teachers have actually nicknamed the desk the cockpit because it controls so much. This is another class that we inherited. This is what it looked like last May. This is what it looks like today. You can see all the, t all the students um, in groups working on laptops and um, all students are issued with laptops to work in Marlborough Street and Cahill Brewer Street uh, because you need the laptops to, to engage with the technology. Um, and, ever, and we have IT support for students on site. Just to give you another idea of the facilities that would be available, here is the student common room we inherited last May. This is what it looks like today. That's a uh, student common room today. You can see easy chairs and um, round tables and chairs for people to work at or to eat their lunch or whatever they want to do. The courses in Calester, just to give you a, a flavor, there you have courses in the natural sciences, in, in pre-university science, pre-university environmental and biodiversity studies. Uh, obviously by their name, you're dealing with um, courses that are designed for further study, for progression. Nursing and healthcare courses, dental nursing traineeship, um, that is actually accredited by the, de the, the, the Irish Dental Council. We're the only ones in the country to have it. And that is accredited at higher uh, certificate level level six. We do beauty therapy, including nail technology, various business studies, um, a new course that was put in place. Um, this it just started its second year with logistics and distribution was a direct response to Brexit and the um, incredible need from employers for people who are trained in customs. And part of the course is that they do the industry standard customs training course. Childcare and social studies area, creative, creative area, travel and tourism and computing. We do computer networking and cybersecurity or pre-university data analytics. How to apply, you can apply directly to the college online from January or through the CAO. You've, there, are, there is no application fee. Uh, you can visit our visual, virtual open days or in-person open day sessions, which will be taking place next year in uh, the 23rd of February in the afternoon between two and four or the 17th of May between 10 and one and all the costs are on the individual course pages. So we're on social media as well for those who are in so the social media world. Okay, and that's me done. And thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Rory, um, for going through all of that. It was really interesting. It certainly looks like a really inviting 
some inviting spaces that you've created there. So well done. Looks great. Thank you. Um, I, I, I suppose we said we'd keep questions until the end, but I suppose I had a question myself. Sure. Um, and that is if uh, a young person is to go to your open day um, yeah. next year and decide or, or or any other further education, open uh, colleges for open day. Yeah. What's, what's the next steps in terms of, I suppose, identifying the the additional needs that they they might have and what's your yep. approach to to dealing with that okay um well at an open day but i suppose the the purpose from a from a a potential student's point of view is to i suppose get additional information get a get a feel for the college do they like the feel of the building do they like the feel of the atmosphere you know, to where they are, they well, do they feel welcome? Are they welcomed in the into the building? Um, so if they're coming, they're coming to the event, we'll have all the staff on site. In many cases, there'll be some of our current students there to explain what the course is all about. If somebody has um, additional needs, and they could, be, they could be a variety of different needs. Um, We will have the learning support officer on site at the open day to begin the conversation. The idea, be, the idea being that by the time the courses start in September, all the supports are in place, any any additional requirements are in place on day one. The idea that a course a student has to start a course and then we apply for the stuff. I'm afraid I've never held with that. And uh, mind you, the accountants in our head office you know, often have an issue with that, but um, my my uh, my view is that the, the students take priority over accounting. Does that answer the question? It does. Yeah, thank you. That's that, that answers that, Rory. Thanks a million. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to Fletcher now. Fletcher, thanks very much for joining us. And we're looking forward to hearing about your experiences. Um, and I know, as your mom explained, earlier you've been through a lot over the last few years um but I suppose if we start with youth reach why did you decide to leave school and um and go to youth reach well um I I got diagnosed with um, heart failure and transplant and I was in hospital pretty much full time so I couldn't go to school um my mom had asked for the curriculum from the school many times, um, but we never got it. Um, and there, there is a hospital in Crumlin, uh, or sorry, school in Crumlin Hospital that um, I think, unfortunately, I just fell between the cracks and just didn't didn't get visited by them very often. So after the transplant, when I was feeling better, uh, I managed to return to education, but knew that the secondary school hadn't been very helpful. So. Um, we yeah we went we kind of looked and obviously my mom works in adult education so I knew that that wasn't the only option there was um we decided on youth reach um just because it was it was good you know it was uh one I ca I got to keep my um my uh disability payment as well which is great um and it was it was a lot more um personal I suppose than secondary school you know there was over a thousand students I think in my school so it was kind of very crazy and uh, busy so the person the personalized uh, kind of teaching there really helped um, but I could just kind of I could miss a few days or a week and I wouldn't be left behind I just pick up where I left off with the portfolio which was very helpful Sorry, I muted myself there. I could hear somebody thundering up the stairs. I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> Thanks, Fletcher. Um, and I'm delighted that you found something that was the right option for you and that your mom was there to with all of that knowledge. Um, because it's it's not easy, I suppose, to make that leap for a lot of families, but and that you're both here now to help other families who might be in a similar situation to you. Um, so thank you for that. So I think you, you've you've told us a bit about youth reach and what how it was different to school, I suppose in terms of your um your wellness and ability to attend um you know was that were they, was it was it flexible enough for you in that way and that you were able to attend when you could? 
Yeah, it was. It was really um, flexible. Uh, yeah, because I would kind of obviously be out for a while with a doctor's appointments and I'd get sick again. I was actually diagnosed with diabetes while I was in year three. Um, but yeah, that was that was really helpful. That kind of I could just like that, just miss however many days. And, you know, because in school, you just be kind of left behind and you wouldn't know what you're doing and then come on a, up in a test and you'd kind of just be stuck but that was brilliant because I just got to continue from where I was and the teacher would walk me through it and they were really helpful they were really understanding of the situation as well. Great and what what happened after you three I know you went to a further education college what did you study where did you go and what did you study? Yeah I went to uh, Dunboyne further education college and I studied animal care and dog grooming so that was was really good um I did unfortunately have to leave uh, my mental health wasn't great and um I figured that a full-time course just wasn't for me but they were really great in there all with the tutors and the the support hub was really great I think there was a lot of tools that I could have utilized that I didn't but you know they set up an appointment uh before I started and kind of took down my what I had and kind of what difficulties I might have like my chronic fatigue and chronic pain so that the tutors would know and kind of understand if I had to leave mid lesson and that kind of thing it's really helpful okay that's good to hear I suppose Fletcher would you have any advice for anyone who's maybe in secondary school or coming to the end of secondary school as to looking into their options or I suppose even advocating for themselves and saying what they need and and like you know if you have any advice for anyone in that position yeah I mean it's it's definitely not easy um especially in Ireland where it's kind of a lot of focus on junior cert and leaving cert and that's the it really isn't the only option there's so many options out there um to you know to you know look up on your computer anywhere kind of like that uh and lots of different you know full-time course and part-time that, that can help that kind of thing yeah, I think even just seeing those options is a relief in itself to know that it's not a full time or nothing. You know, if that's not what you're able for right now, there are plenty of other options out there. So that's great. Thanks very much, Fletcher. Really appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, so thanks to everybody. And if anyone has any questions or raised hands, Geraldine, if you're still on, I know you raised your hand earlier and I didn't get to it. Um, so if you want to do it again. I'll bring you on. In the meantime, I do have a couple of questions if if you want to put any questions into the chat. Um, I'll put out the question before we decide who answers this because I'm not sure who's best. One of the questions was the best way for young people to talk to their school about these routes. Is this something that they're going to have to research themselves? Would it be coming from the school? What's the best way? Melissa, maybe I'll come to you for that one. Yeah, so I think, um, again, it probably depends on the school. Um, there is a guidance service in schools and, and quite often schools tend to kind of have a bit of a tunnel vision around CAO, CAO points and progression into higher education. Um, what's helped enormously in the last couple of years, I think, I can't remember when it happened, is that now further education courses and apprenticeships are also now in the CAO so it's not just degree courses, um, which is kind of, I suppose, for schools to engage with them because now there are options available through the CAO. Um, but I do think if you go to an adult education guidance teacher in a secondary school and explain the circumstances and ask, we'll support you around that. Um, and they can link in, you know, with our services as well in the further education and training sector. Um, so I like I think the first step would certainly be the guidance counts in school and um, perhaps if there's like a special education needs coordinator as well, I'm sure they would have information about it, too. Um, and then I suppose if that's not available through you to you through the school for whatever reason, and um, then maybe to go outside the school and look for that information and support. Okay. Or you have. Yeah, yeah right. I'll come in there. Yeah, um, the thing about the CAO, just to bear in mind, is just because the deadline for CAO applications is the 1st of, of February, um, 
applications for further education colleges are taken right the way up through and through the summer. So that doesn't change. Just the, you, you know, the you, applying through the CAO is only available to the first, till the 1st of February. Um, and while there is an application fee for higher education, there isn't an application fee for further education. So just, just to be aware of that. Um, in terms of information, um, there are an increasing number of guidance uh, counselors who are more and more aware of further education options. But further education, uh, one of its strengths is that it's it's very, very much a local provision. So we, rather than you will often see with the universities, you have to possibly even uh, move house or move residence to actually take up a course. In further education, it can often be kind of, you can actually commute to the course, you know, so it's it's maybe to check out the area that you're in. Uh, look at the local ETB website and they will list all the colleges and you might be, you might actually be surprised at how much is actually available in your local area. Go onto the websites, find out the information that's there and most definitely visit the college uh, for open days. Absolutely do that. And that'd be the same advice I would give for higher education as well. I wouldn't, you know, um, the idea that somebody will apply for a course and, and have never visited the place, um, I think is I think is a huge mistake. OK, thanks. Um, Mayor Clare, I know you had a question. I think you might do it justice. I'm not sure I fully understand it. It's in relation to progressing from the first level right through. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, just said thank you, Rory, Melissa, particularly Fletcher for for sharing your um, words of advice. It's a, it's been really, it's a, about I've learned so much um, listening listening to you and a lot of information that I was I wasn't aware of, um, and it's fantastic to see that there are all these other routes to education out there. And I think we will kind of take away from this and see how we can assist our community in communicating these alternative routes to education. We want every um, young person who has or who has had cancer to know that there is a route to education, whatever that might be, to suit them out there. And I suppose my question was really, can you, um, let's say a, a, a young person who has had cancer, and, and Fletcher has explained how she started a couple of co uh, course, for example, in Dunboyne, and then because of, of um, um, her particular circumstance, it wasn't possible for her to continue. So how firstly, how flexible are these courses? Like if Fletcher said, well, you know, I'd like to go back to the same course again next year. I presume they are very flexible in with with people's individual needs. One of the things I, I'll say, seeing that uh, Fletcher hi highlighted the the um, example of Dunboyne College, uh, which is a fine, fine college. And Dennis Leonard is a, is a is an excellent principal. Um, the it, it will very much depend on the circumstances, but the system is very flexible. For example, um, in my own college, we have had uh, childhood cancer survivors uh, come to us. And um, what we can do is we could actually, sometimes the, uh, the sheer volume of material to be covered is too much. Mm -hmm. So the course can be actually delivered over two years. And so or they can take the course over two years. You can actually, um, because of the way the certification is, it's a kind of a building block approach. So you can actually take half the modules one year and half the modules the following year. Now, the thing to bear in mind, and this is something that you arrange with the college, um, progression from further ed to higher ed is, is almost exclusively based on a single year sitting of exams. All right. So. Um, it is important to have this discussion and have this arrangement with the local college so that can be facilitated. All right. Um, but like if, if we have had students um, in, in um, not maybe necessarily Fletcher's exact situation, but who have had to leave the course early for um, um, illness reasons or family health reasons or, or whatever reason, we would often defer their application from one year to the next. Uh, in my own college, we have on a number of courses, we are increasingly semesterizing. So people will have half their modules completed by Christmas. So if they if they were to leave 
in the second semester, they at least have the first semester finished and done and their certification is complete. So it very much varies from college to college and course to course, but there is flexibility available in the system. In fact, in the QQI um, certification, colleges such as mine are required to document how you will provide flexibility in your assessment and and so on and so forth. So it's it's actually inbuilt into our system. Uh, now it's that doesn't mean we are universally flexible to the nth degree, but we do have a degree of flexibility. Yes. I hope that's helpful now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Um, and Karen had a question there. Do you have to have completed your leaving search to access further education, a further education course? OK, um, the. In recent years, there are increasingly a number of colleges who do not have formal entry requirements anymore for all these various reasons. We would have mature students who uh, finished at junior cert or at group cert or inter cert back in the day. And. But they've worked all their lives and are returning for us to say that you need your leaving cert excludes those people from. Uh, people in that in that circumstances, equally people who are, have been unable to complete the leaving cert for a variety of reasons. So the the way the entry requirement is phrased is that the student has to demonstrate the capacity to successfully participate on the course. One of those ways may be to have the leaving cert, but that doesn't that's not necessarily the only way. This is where the interview comes in. The person who you who will be interviewing you is the person who's running the course. So they will know, they will have a conversation with you and they will ask, you know, what have you done? What have you completed? Did you do your mocks? Did you not? Did you like, so we've had a variety. So it would be a conversation. And then it would be, um, it's more likely that you will be offered a chance if you are, if you are close. There are three outcomes to an application. There's yes, there's no, when there's yes with support. So they're the three outcomes. So, it, so it's, a, it's a judgment call, to be honest. But our bottom line is we won't set up somebody, set somebody up to fail. Mm. Right, there, so you have to demonstrate that. So um, the, um, the, what they call the predictive rate of success of the tutors um, interviews is in the mid to high 90%. Because the, because the people interviewing are the people who run the course, they know it so well that they can tell from a conversation. And if, for example, there is a need for a further conversation, be it with the learning support officer or be it with the guidance counselor, for example, that can sometimes happen. In, in a number of courses in further education where, for example, uh, mathematics is required, so like in the sciences or you know the business area where there's accounting that kind of thing we would often look for at least ordinary level uh maths in the leave insert kind of standard mm. and again if somebody was doing the ordinary level course but didn't complete for whatever reason that would be perfectly fine and i'm speaking as a former maths teacher so uh, yeah. like that's so it's it's not black and white it's a conversation and people form a judgment and form an opinion um, on the basis of the conversation and you know any evidence that might be required at a point there is another thing about this you know um, particularly in a lot of formal systems like we're trying to be flexible in a rigid education system which can sometimes be um, an art in itself um, we do not necessarily require uh, somebody to have a formal diagnosis to get support if you need support and if our learning support officer says you need support, we will apply, we will just give it to you. I do not and I will never uh, refuse somebody an application for some reason because they don't have, you know, we give you a place if we can get the funding to provide you with the sports. I have never in, in 22 years as principal, I've never done that once. And I would never do it because it's basically it's illegal as far as I'm concerned. And it's ethically wrong to do that. So we would always provide the support. If I have to recoup the money through, you know, state funds and some other application, well, then so be it. But um, 
my job, number one, my job is provide the support for the student on day one. Okay. Now, the other thing to bear in mind, the final point, I'm sorry, the no. final point I'll say is that just because we've come to a learning support agreement at the beginning, and if the word is agreement, because the student will know their particular needs, we will know the curricular demand of the course. So it's in a conversation that an agreement is arrived at. But let's say a month down the road, four weeks down the road or whatever, there's something not working, then that can be revisited. So the initial agreement is a working document and it's kept, you know, it can be kept in review and it can, and it can be changed if needed. Is that all right? That's great. Thanks, Rory. Um, Karen, who's a teacher from Roscommon, has some questions. They're quite specific. Sorry. Karen. Sanuda, can I just come in oh, there? Yes. Sorry, quickly. Melissa. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I suppose it's just in relation to that question about do you need a leaving cert mm. to do further education? Um, and, and I suppose just to mention those other programs that I suppose are outside the further education colleges, which which offer yeah. courses at level five and level six. Um, and actually the target group, the target group for like one of our main target groups for those for those programs are people without um kind of upper or lower level secondary education. So a lot of our learners will come in with primary school only education or the junior cert um, or, you know, so like just to, just to mention that those educate those education programs um, are absolutely open to anybody, regardless of their education level. Thank you for that, Melissa. Um... Sorry, I lost Karen's question. Yeah, sorry, Karen. I'll go to your third question because the first two I think are, are quite specific. Um, the third one being about a student with multiple learning difficulties who mm -hmm. at Leaving Cert who's interested in sociology and politics. Are there any routes for students through the PLC route who might struggle at, as a, for an example, an arts degree? And I suppose there are, we're talking about maybe mm -hmm. further education being the goal as opposed to higher education being the goal. Uh, I hope I'm I'm taking your your question right there, Karen. Um, Rory, do you have any advice there? Yeah, um, yeah. I was looking at Karen's questions, and they're the you're right. They are specific, and that's that's perfectly fine. Um, the we we would have students who would come to us, um, with multiple dif difficulties, um, and the range of supports that would be on offer would be, you know, they could be should we say in-class learning support, the fact that all the material is available electronically, um, it is available online. Um, that's another That's another kind of general support that's available to all students. There could be the issue of maybe the, uh, delivering the course or taking the course in two chunks, doing half one year, half the other. So there's a variety of different ways. In terms of the specifics um, of taking a course. Now, in terms of struggling uh, to do an, let's say who might struggle, um, at say an arts degree at third level. Um, is the struggle to do with academic standard or is the struggle to do with the pace of learning or the volume of learning? It's so I'm going to, if it's, if it's uh, the pace uh, of learning or whatever, there could be an element of that further education might build up the educational stamina as it were. So that might be a way to do it because the uh, methodology, the assessment, uh, teaching and assessment methodology in further education is virtually identical to higher education. So it can often be you learn the basic skills of independent learning, working on your own, doing assignments um, in a more protected environment than it can be in, a, in some of the university environments. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to the universities. The universities are, uh, they do excellent work but sometimes the lecture halls can be absolutely enormous. Um, I, I still have nightmares of Theatre L in UCD with all 500 students for anyone who's ever been in it. Um, whereas in a, in a further education environment, the way we would phrase it is we are outside of post-primary in, in what we do, but we still have the pastoral care tradition of second level. So we still look after our students. In terms of the struggle, um, if it is an academic struggle, then the ambition to go to third level, you'd have to maybe raise questions about at this stage. That isn't to say that over time that that can't be achieved, but that'd be the way I would go with that. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think 
Um, I hope so too. I think that was a good answer. Thanks, Rory. Um, at what point in the application process do you disclose your health background or any ongoing issues? Question from Ashlyn. Personally, I'm of the view, say it from, de from, the, from day one, but you begin the conversation, you begin the um, process of preparing learning supports because mm. These conversations, it's not its not a single conversation. It can often be just a series of conversations. Now, having said that, we would have students with special educational needs who have been labeled SEN right the way through primary school, right the way through secondary school, and they get to further ed and said, no, I just want to be an ordinary student. Leave me alone. And they're perfectly entitled to do, to do that. So it is, it is, we have often had the case where a student will say, no, I don't want any supports. And some of them have needed quite profound supports. Um, so that has proven to be a battle at times where a student is trying to, shall we say, expand into the world um, and break free of what the perceived constraints, which is, is great to see. It can often be somewhat um, chaotic at times, but we have to support our students in that in that exploration. But sometimes the exploration could involve <laughs> them accepting no more than any of us at any time in our life. Yes, I do need help at this time, mm. you know, so but it's entirely <clears throat> in their own gift. Yeah, Fletcher. What's your, been your experience there? Do you think it's a good idea to talk about any of your health issues or anything that you might need in terms of education support at an earlier stage? I think, yeah, if that's what you choose to want, like you said, some people just kind of go, nope, I don't want that. I don't want to be, you know, and that's absolutely okay as well. For me, uh, I think it helped a lot when I did it early, actually in the online application to the Dunboyne Education, uh, Further Education College, they ask if you have any special needs or uh, health mm. problems and then you can put that in there and I can't remember if it was an email or a phone call but they said do you want an appointment with the learning hub and they can help you and you know give you any supports you need and uh, let you let your teachers know uh, if you have any additional needs in the classroom as well so that was really helpful um yeah I think it is usually better if that's what you choose to do obviously yeah. uh to, to go in as early as, early as possible and say it Okay, thanks for that, Fletcher. Melissa, do you want to add anything there? Is that okay? Um, yeah, no, I think I think Rory and, and Fletcher have covered it nicely yeah. there. So great. Helen, you have your hand up. So I'm just going to bring you on to the stage and you can unmute yourself. Um has that worked, Helen? Doesn't look like you're muted to me, Helen, but you might need to just double check. Um, any joy, Helen? Tell you, I'll go to another question. Um, oh, sorry, Helen, I see you've put a, a question into the chat. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Patricia, oh, thanks. Oh, sorry, I think I'm here now. Great. Thanks, Helen. How are you? Sorry about that. No yeah, worries. sorry about that. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I, sorry, I put my question in the chat eventually. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, I'm here twice now. But, um, so Children in Hospital Ireland are working on an update of the Healthcare Transitions website, steppingup.ie, and we've had one focus group um so far, and the the youth that we spoke to when we asked them if there was one any one additional content section they could add was about understanding education pathways and supports available. So just you know, great conversation tonight and huge learnings. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. And I was just wondering, is there any kind of one resource that does contain a lot of the information shared tonight? You know, just, you know, a lot, you know, it's just in our kind of content, content building, you just go bounce all over the place and not able to find it all kind of in one place. Melissa, any advice there in terms of one stop shop or does it does it it doesn't exist, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. So it's good. It it's great exist, if you're creating yeah. it. Helen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, and Rory mentioned this, like because it's so, I suppose, localized and specialized, the provision, it, it does tend to be hard to locate those places that that hold all the information. Um, 
I think fetch courses in terms of if it's information about further education and training, I think the fetch courses website, the fetch hub it is probably a very good one, but it doesn't really give specific details about courses and then local ETB websites, um, which can kind of shine a lot of lights on our light on information, our courses that are available locally. Um, Rory, do you know of any that any kind of one stop shop for the further education and training sector? Hmm. Um, well, it, it, of course, it all depends on 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 the specifics. Um, but because it's so local, I have um, I would tend to advise people to start off with their local ETB. Um, and if you go into the further ed colleges or the adult ed service or youth reach, um, you will find where your local um, premises are. And you, you might be surprised at how local uh, your nearest one is. Um, generally speaking, um, students will have an interest in a course in a specific area. Uh, rather than a generic, mm -hmm. I'm interested in anything and I've no, I've absolutely no idea. They will more likely to say, I don't want something to do with animals. I don't want something to do with computers. I like something to do with, so it'll be, it tends to be a little bit more course specific to start. That is where fetch courses might be an idea. The, the, the website I particularly like is actually run by a private company called Careers Portal. Now, uh, the reason, well, I suppose the reason I like it is that we're in a partnership with them um, insofar as from all of our courses, if you want to see the links, it actually uses the careers portal as a vehicle. So if you just go straight to careers portal, you will probably find an awful lot of information there. But um, the one stop shop, I'd say over my career, I've heard the phrase one stop shop. Can we not have a one stop shop so many times in so many different places? Um, and while um, I, I, it's one of those utopian ideals that everybody hopes for, but it never has been achieved. To be to be absolutely honest, I would be inclined to start off with broad general areas of courses or what you're interested in, and then follow that down to maybe the handful of courses you're interested in, and then track through that from those courses. What are the pathways from those courses? Because um, it's it's because there's so many courses out there. There's about 4,000 further education courses in Ireland. There's um, it's about four times the number of of higher education courses on the CAO, believe it or not. So trying to get a one stop shop that'll do everything, given the level of dynamic change that happens on an ongoing basis is um, has proven elusive for anybody who um, was hoping for it in the few, in the past. I think, Helen, even having some of the information from here tonight would be really helpful as a start um, and even just sort of signposting people to those um, websites that will lay out all of mm. that information and they can, you know, as, as a start and then they can go down the specific route that might be more suitable for them. I think that will, will be quite helpful. Yeah, I agree. Developing. Thank you. And yeah, even even I think some kind of important considerations and things to think about just some of what's been shared tonight is just just like, oh, people need to know. So this has just been great just alone from tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, there's a couple of other questions that I just wanted to get to Patricia. Um, who is one of our uh, directors in Child Cancer Ireland, <clears throat> is there a way for young people to get neuropsychological testing or reports to help identify their areas of challenge? Patricia, if you put up your hand, maybe, I'm not sure if you mean while in, uh, do, you mean, do you mean in second level to prepare for further education or some of the other options that we've discussed here this evening? Um, thanks, Patricia. One second, I'll bring you on. Hi, Patricia. Just need to unmute. Oh, there you Hi. go. Hi, Patricia. Hi, how are you doing, folks? How are you? Um, huge thanks to everybody who here this evening. It's just incredible uh, information, and um, I think it will change lives, really genuinely do. Um, one of the questions I had was, um, is there a way? It's traditionally been very difficult for people to access specific summary of what their actual challenges are. They know 
they may have challenges, they know they may have issues, but to actually get a proper educational report that can help them on their way um, outside the, at any time, really, you know, yeah. whenever they're trying to. Oh, we lost Patricia. <laughs> I think we got the gist of the question. Hmm. Sorry, Patricia, I don't know what happened there. Can I take that one, so? Yeah, absolutely, Roy, yeah. thank you. Um, Right, there's two parts to the question as much as I as, as far as I understand it and please forgive me Patricia if I take the wrong slant is the issue of getting a diagnosis that you can then sort of say that you know this this young person has the following areas of uh, that need to be taken into account in terms of a learning support strategy the other side of it is that if we go back to the what I was talking about earlier on, that it begins with a conversation at the open day. That if you ha start that conversation, and while you may not have an official diagnosis, generally speaking, the student or the the applicants themselves knows what their own particular like. I could, I find it difficult to do this. I find that okay. I find, you know, and so on. So it begins with that conversation. The learning support agreement that comes out of it basically is issued to all all uh, subject teachers for that particular group. So that learning support agreement, if it begins at the open day in February, is the type of thing that can be revisited several times and even after the course starts can be revisited. So I know in further ed, I wouldn't say it's necessary to have a formal diagnosis, but the person themselves may, may like to have a formal diagnosis. Now, I don't know if I've answered the question, Patricia, I hope so. Thanks, Rory. Um, I'm just seeing, is Patricia still here? Yeah, you can let us know, Patricia, if that answered it for you. And actually, Patricia, I thought if you want to raise your hand again, you might be helpful in, in helping to answer the next question from Marcella, which is about, any specific, is there any specific pathway for young people with acquired brain injury? Um, so if your child is currently in an ETB secondary school with processing difficulties and physical disability due to an acquired brain injury, um, you know, which is linked to a childhood cancer diagnosis, is there any specific pathway for acquired brain injury? And Patricia, I know you've had some experience there. I just can't remember, Patricia, if if what you had recommended before was for 18 plus or younger, you might come back on and let us know that. But in the meantime, maybe Melissa or Rory want to answer that one. Um, just there is an acquired brain injury uh, support service. We actually run classes with them and um, we provide community education classes to them. They have two centres in Dublin. I don't know in terms of nationally what services they have. And I do know, I don't think Patricia's back in yet, um, but they do offer kind of diagnostic services as well. Um, but as far as I understand it, it's for people over the age of 18. Um, and maybe, yeah, Patricia could clarify that. Um, Rory, did, did you know of any other? Yeah, um, if, if, if I'm correct, the... There's a specific charity. Is it Brainwave that uh, looks after people with acquired brain injury? Is that correct? Headway, I think. Headway, Headway. Sorry, Headway. Yeah. But they they actually are working in partnership with Colossiida College of Further Education in Finglas on on specific programs. But again, we've had people with acquired brain injury, as have many further ed colleges. So it all depends on the degree of injury and you know the degree of difficulty that's involved. Sometimes. If it's if it's on the relatively modest end of 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 need, then it could be possibly handled in a in a mainstream way in support through standard UDL teaching and learning practices, or maybe some of the things that we've spoken about here today, doing the course over two years and that that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um... And I suppose that Rory, as you said, they Headway have developed something in partnership with Colossus Edip. That's not to say that they might be able to advise or oh yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. you know, um, help help you to to figure out what's available more locally. Mm. Um, Mary Claire, sorry, I don't need to. Yeah, you just need to unmute Mary Claire. Sorry, this just question. If there is time, um, I'm just wondering, um, you know. 
the LSA agreement, I presume, is done with the student. The student yes. is okay. And if there isn't uh, any type of an educational um, psychological assessment, um, how how do you know that the, the student is giving you all the appropriate information? Is the school involved in any way? Are there any other documentation involved? And I, I just say this from my own experience of, mm. of dealing with my daughter, who um, it was the equivalent at the university. I think the the agreement was was done up with her. But so much had been left out and very, very important sure. things that should have been in there that were clearly um, dealt with in her educational assessment seem to have been completely overlooked. And, yeah. you know, so the she was registered with the disability service. It just didn't work out and she just didn't get the support that she needed. But I felt in hindsight, we could have done it better. Uh, the college should have been given an awful lot more information and the college yeah. should have been much more interactive um, with her and, and vice versa. There was fault on both sides. Sure. But I'm just wondering how do you deal with those types of situations? Yeah. The difficulty, I have, a, like if somebody has a psychological report or, or a, an evaluative report or some sort of a diagnostic report, that's great. But the way the funding system is set up is it requires it for to release the funding. But if a student doesn't have a report, they move into the whole waiting list area and they may or may not get a report in time. Um, even going through private channels, they may not get it in time because in a one year course, now we say one year, but it's actually two semesters, which is 24 weeks of classes in total. So in the absence of a formal diagnosis, we engage in a conversation or a dialogue with the student and our and our learning support officer is is very experienced and highly qualified. So it has proven to be in the absence of a formal diagnosis, um, reasonably successful. I won't say perfect, there's because in the end of the day, it's, you know, the student will say, I'm I am. I have a difficulty in A and B, I'm okay in C and D, you know, I'm not sure about E and F. And if there's a follow-up um, assessment or screen or a screening tool or anything that we can use to facilitate that, we will use. Um, but you, this is why I'm saying if we can start the conversation back at the open day in February, we have the time to actually explore all of these conversations. So it's it's not a single event. You're not send, send, sending in a form and it's not a desktop exercise. It is a series of conversations and they go through the summer months as well. Like we don't stop just because the, the courses are finished. The disability support officer, the learning support service is available during the summer months for this very reason. Okay, that's good to know. Right? I hope that's helpful, Mary. I don't I don't know whether I've answered the question or not for you, but I hope it's helpful. But I understand what you're saying. These things are never perfect, and it's the only thing perfect about them is hindsight. Mm. And there's a question there from Patricia that maybe I'll ask you, Melissa. Do you, and then Rory, is there a place for parents to be involved in? Sorry, I just lost the question there for a second. In um, setting up more appropriate supports for the students <coughs> Melissa as a parent put, yeah, put your par parent hat on for this one my parent what? hat on me um that's that's it because I I can see flesh with smiling at me yeah. um <laughs> it's it's a tricky one to negotiate because I think first of all you have to you have to realize that they are adults you know it is different from the school setting and and I suppose you have to encourage their independence in, in as much as as you can um and, and kind of provide the safety net then if, if you kind of see things aren't going according to plan um I think it has to be like I think it has to be led by the young person that's and I've I've kind of I've worked in um in third level and I've I've seen kind of parents kind of take the lead and the and the young person is standing behind them as they're advocating for them um and and it's with the best of intentions but ultimately it's it's not really helpful for the young person or for the college because you know your the college's relationship or the the education the place of education their relationship is directly with the learner 
Um, so I think it's time maybe, and it's a really hard one to do because as a parent of, of a young person with kind of serious health issues, you're kind of used to being in there and barging in with your sharpened elbows and um, advocating very strongly and very loudly. So it's a difficult transition sometimes to kind of move move behind the young person and let them take the lead. Um, and, and I think it was just to go back to what Rory said about um, young people coming in and not wanting supports, even though they might have had them all the way through school. Like that's a really difficult thing to watch as a, as a parent as well. Mm. Um, because you know you're kind of there going no you need those supports and the young person is kind of saying you know what I want to kind of fly solo on this but it's all learning you know at the end of the day it's all learning and and sometimes that particular turn of the wheel mightn't work out like um but but the next one will so I do think uh certainly a watchful eye and a support a role but letting the young person lead is probably the best the best uh, approach. Hmm. You agree with that, Fletcher? Um, and I suppose, yeah, Fletcher, is that, is that something? Sorry, sorry, Fletcher. Is that something you feel you three might have might have helped with that it was a bit more um, that that you were a bit more in charge of your own uh, education or plan along with you three? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, because I was six and uh, I was a kid, I've kind of been very used to my mom kind of being up front and, and she was brilliant and she is brilliant. Um, and then it was kind of, you know, quite quite recent that it was kind of changing, you know, passing the torch on to me for my um, mm. application. So it was, it was good, you know, with you three, you three really did help. Uh, that's kind of when I mostly started with you know advocating for myself and um and she's still very good you know I think when you've gotten sick as a child I think you kind of might always need your mommy just in the, in the background just just in case you know but yeah I, I personally prefer to lead it myself um I I know that some people for a while I didn't you know I was quite shy and I didn't really know what to do but you know uh, it does it does kind of come a time where I think um it should be quite patient led hmm. yeah well I think you're a good team the pair of you <laughs> can Rory, I do you want to add anything? yeah yeah absolutely. just just a little um like I think I think uh Melissa and F Fletcher have described um a real situation and the kind of the grayness of it and there are no black and white the black and white legal situation under gdpr is that we would as a college would require the student who's over 18 to give us permission in writing for somebody for us to speak to a parent uh, about their situation and i've had parents contact me you know to check is so and so attending they leave the house every day but we don't know if they're attending so i've had i've had everything from that point of view, in relation to students who have health issues or special educational needs issues, um, another part of the grayness is at what point does somebody constitute a vulnerable adult? And that again is another shade of gray. Um, it's a judgment call, to be honest. The priority, as as Fletcher rightly says, it's um, the, the student leads and should take the priority. But um, there are a, a very small number of occasions where a conversation may be needed with the, because in many cases and for many families, the parent is the, the carer, the student's carer, you know? So it's it's not necessarily the most straightforward thing in the world, but, the black and white situation is we need the permission in writing and generally that's the easiest way to go uh, and if it's given fine then that's easy and if it's not given well sometimes there may be circumstances particularly if there is a concern that the person is doing is has the potential to do themselves harm not intentionally necessarily but you know that that is a concern and we have a duty of care to all our students in that respect Okay, thanks for that, Rory. I'm just going to ask one final question um, and we'll let everybody go and have a nice cup of tea. 
Is the National Council for Special Education involved in any way for students transitioning out of sixth year? No. That's no. a straightforward a answer. Fair, straightforward, no. Um, the Epson Act limits their exposure, their involvement to students um, no older than 18 years. Okay. Thanks for that, Rory. All right. I don't, I don't think I've missed any questions. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Oh, sorry. One final thing I wanted to say when I see um, Evelyn Griffith from Canteen Online is that if anybody is not aware of or in touch with Canteen Ireland to go and um, have a look at their website. And certainly if you have either um, a young person or somebody coming up to that age, um, they're a fantastic organisation um, to be involved with. Uh, Fletcher, I know. I know you've been involved with with Canteen and you're you're nodding there. So, you know, it's definitely one to reach out to. Um, and yeah, so I suppose we'll just finish up by saying thank you very much to Fletcher, Melissa and Rory. I think all of the options that have been outlined tonight will give people a lot of um of of hope and scope to to go and look into afterwards. Um if you know, if you're a parent of a young person doing that alongside them, or if you're a teacher, you know, we had a few teachers on here tonight, and thank you for that. Um, that you feel a bit more equipped, I suppose, to to help any young people, um, uh, any childhood cancer survivors in, in your life. So I hope we've done that tonight. Thank you very much, as I said to to Rory and Melissa for their expertise and thank you so much to Fletcher I think your contribution was really valuable mm -hmm. um, and so important for people to hear directly from you and your experience so thank you for that um, I will end the recording now I will send out the recordings of, and the the information and the resources that were shared so that um, everyone can um, refer back to that as they as they wish so I'll just stop the recording